I think one of the most revolutionary fly tying materials that has ever come to fly tying, pretty bold statement, but <laughs> I truly believe it to be the case is UV resin. Today, we're going to be having the first ever Mainly Flies podcast. I am pretty excited to get into this. We got all kinds of uh, new gear that just arrived. And um, the reason I wanted to start this in the first place is largely because uh, with our fly tying videos, I get all kinds of questions uh, from beginners to experts. And there's so many of you guys asking questions that it's just really hard for me to give detailed answers like I I'd want to to everyone it's just it's it's got to the point it's not really possible so that's where this podcast comes in we're gonna get we're gonna be able to take deeper dives into specific subjects and I'll share my knowledge on on the specific topic and based on everyone's feedback I thought yeah why not um, just pick up the gear and go for it I don't like thinking about things too much I just kind of jump into them and figure them out as I go but anyway, today's episode is going to be more about getting to know me. As you know, with the fly tying videos, we like to keep them short format. That's a whole, that's one of the big parts of it. And I think what makes my videos special in comparison to everyone else is I just get right to the meat of it. I give you a couple of the prime facts about the fly, maybe a few ways of how to use it and show you how to tie it. This is going to be a little bit opposite of that. So in a podcast, we're going to be able to go into some more detail. I can flesh out different flies, you know, tell you about the history of things, which I, I really enjoy. And I haven't really said that in uh, any of the videos other than the titles, but I, I really do enjoy the history of fly tying. But today I'm going to talk about myself so you can get to know me just a little bit better. So yeah, my name is Jesse Rochester and I got into fly tying a long time ago. Uh, so I am 28 years old right now. And I think the first fly that I ever tied, I was probably around seven years old, I want to say, something like that. Uh, so I learned to tie from my grandfather, who unfortunately passed away uh, just last year. Uh, but I remember specifically tying my first fly. I was sitting in his lap and he was showing me how to do it. And I was just, I was not. Um, as you know, if, you, if you've tried fly tying, your first fly is definitely not that pretty. And I started off with a dry fly, which in a lot of cases can be particularly challenging. And this particular fly that I was making, which was a childhood favorite of mine for maybe five years or so, there was a period when I first started fly fishing that uh, I didn't know that there was this vast variety of flies that you could use. I grew up uh, in the transition towards YouTube and social media and stuff. But at that time, you know, we didn't have access to that. You learned by the people around you and just learning on your own. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that first fly that I tied and my favorite for a good five years, it was the only fly that I ever fished uh, was the Royal Coachman. Uh, particularly the dry fly uh, that I would always tie was a royal wolf. And if you know that fly pattern, you know that it's not exactly beginner friendly. <laughs> so they weren't the prettiest flies in the world. But, you know, as uh, as I mentioned in a, a few of my videos, you don't have to tie fly, a pretty fly to catch a, catch a fish. As long as you're matching the profile and you have a, the general right pattern that that fish is looking for chances are it's going to bite it and uh, especially where i grew up which was uh well, we'll get into that next so i was born in uh, fort kent maine which uh if you're familiar with the state of maine that's as far as you can go before <laughs> getting going to canada I, I mean the hospital i was born at was a stone's throw away from the border and uh, that part of maine is pretty old school and Maine is in general we're, we're pretty slow to change so I grew up learning to tie and fishing a lot of classic patterns things like the black ghost or the wood special mickey fins um, the classic uh, gray ghost things like that those were all patterns that my grandfather tied and fished religiously just simply because they do work you know they imitated the primary forage in our area which was smelt really wasn't much reason to, uh, to fish anything else uh, so that's how i got into tying i learned at a pretty young age and i tied for you know very sparsely i didn't do it all the time and then once i got into high school i'd pick up i'd sit at the bench every now and then and tie but definitely wasn't my primary focus then i didn't really get into tying through high school and i only got back into it once i entered college at first the idea was that this was going to be a great way to save money and i get a lot of you guys that mention hey i want to get into fly tying because i want to save some money and 
that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> I spent more money in fly tying materials than I ever have in flies. Uh, the reason being is, you know, if you're very disciplined and you're only going to tie, you know, maybe five patterns, you can make it worthwhile. But my problem is, is I want to tie every size variation in every color variation possible, which ends up being that, you know, if I want to tie a parachute Adams, well, you know, <laughs> you're going to need a hundred, maybe a couple hundred dollars in just different color materials to get that started. As you get into it, you start to accumulate that stuff. But I don't know. I really don't think that uh, fly tying is a great way to save money. <laughs> You know, if you're only going to do black woolly buggers or zebra midges, sure, that might work out for you. But uh, it definitely didn't work out for me. So, yeah, don't let that discourage you if you're looking to save money. Just, you know, be disciplined about it if you're going to go that route. And chances are you're going to get very into fly tying and you'll just get sucked down the rabbit hole of picking up every color of every material. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. So next, I mean, a lot of people wonder how I got into making these videos in the first place. And that was largely, you, you may not know this, but I actually have a second YouTube channel that is technically my primary channel. I have, I've spent about four, I guess, going on five years now working on that channel. And I grew it from zero, of course, all the way to, I think it's at 25 thousand subscribers now and that's very different content than what you're seeing with my fly tying videos in general that was all about um outdoor content i do a lot of hunting fishing uh traveling in my truck gap camper and that's how i got into video making so that's how i got all this gear and through that channel when i was fly fishing i had so many people reach out and say hey um, I really want to try that particular pattern that you're using. And, you know, of course, since I do a lot of my own tying, they're very customized to the waters that I'm fishing and uh, specific bait patterns or, you know, um, when you when you tie, you can pretty much create whatever you like. So my flies, you just can't find them in stores. And it's not like there's big changes in them. You can use premium materials, like maybe I have a bead color that's uh, just not something you'll find in a store or something of the sort. But anyway, I'd have all kinds of people reach out and they'd say, hey, I'd, I'd really love to try that pattern. Do you sell these? And of course, originally the answer was no, I don't. But, you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, why, why not? I might as well tie up a few extra and send them out across, you know, originally just the state of Maine. And uh, I would have all kinds of people fishing them. So that's how I got into it. It was pretty small at first. I'd have a, a person here or there that would just randomly ask for them and I'd, I'd sell them a few. And then I kind of I enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I'm um, just having other people fish my flies and the process of tying a bunch up. So I figured, hey, I'll just go all in on this. And uh, and that's how the business started. And man, has it grown since I've got usually more work than I can keep up with. It's It's been a struggle especially with this new channel. Uh, but anyway, that's how I got into it, was through that other channel. And I used that actually as a means to support myself. That was my primary income and still is my primary income is from fly tying. But anyway, that's how I got into fly tying for a business. And since I had all that camera gear, you know, I was like, you know, geez, it's probably be a good idea <laughs> just to film myself fly tying. And so, yeah, that's how I, I had the camera gear and the knowledge of editing. And since I was already tying at the bench, I thought, well, I might as well film this too. And that's where Mainly Flies was born. So I made a whole new channel and I just posted a few videos of uh, me tying. And they're so much easier to edit, a lot faster to create. And I really enjoy them. So I've made almost one a day now for six months, which is pretty impressive. My other channel, I'd maybe get out one video a week, but we've done quite a few on here and it's, it's worked out really well. So I definitely plan to continue. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. If you want to know more, just drop it in the comments below. Because uh, So here's a little bit about how we're going to structure these. Uh, in this next segment, I've gathered just a couple questions that you guys asked that you wanted answers to. I don't know if you've ever heard the Orvis Tom Rosenbauer's podcast. We're going to be basing that pretty much off of his. Uh, in the fact that I'm going to use this as a way to give better answers to the questions that you guys ask, as well as more in-depth ones. So next time I see someone who asks a specific question about something, I can just 
direct them here and they're going to get a much better answer than I could type up in a couple sentences. So yeah, at the beginning of every podcast, we're going to go through your guys' questions. So on the every podcast episode, comment below your question and I will fit in as many as I can in the first 20 minutes. So that'll be pretty much be the structure. We'll do questions at first and then we'll transition into a specific topic. So anyway, I've gathered a few of your questions that you left in the comments from that last little uh, community post. Uh, so anyway, the first question is, what is your favorite slash least favorite material? So you probably know what my favorite material is. It's any type of dubbing that has long guard hairs in it. I really love hair's ear. Hair's ears in particular have... Um, an incorporation of shorter fibers that they use for insulation. And they also have these longer hairs that kind of stick out a little bit. They're called guard hairs, but that gives it that really nice buggy look that I love because you get this variation of different textures and lengths in the material that just give the flies a really great look because those longer fibers, they catch currents and riffles and they move in the water in a way that we really can't recreate in any other fashion. So, Personally, I love fish and flies like that. And for that reason, I would say that any buggy looking dubbing is my favorite. One that you haven't seen me use on the channel, and I, I don't know why. Another great one is uh, Squirrel. Squirrel has a fantastic look, and I, sh I should actually go after this. I might go tie one just to, to put that up there. But that's probably my favorite material to tie with. Oh, and um, well, hmm, this one might take it though. I think one of the most revolutionary fly tying materials that has ever come to fly tying, pretty bold statement, but <laughs> I truly believe it to be the case, is UV resin. UV resin is amazing. It's, it's extremely versatile. It makes flies super durable. And if you're new to fly tying and you want to make your flies look 10 times better with very little experience, use some UV resin. I mean, if you paint a head over with UV resin and you have a rotating vise, you can get the cleanest looking finish on the head of that fly that is just impossible to achieve with years and years of tying experience. It's pretty revolutionary stuff if you ask me. I, I'm hard to replace it. I mean, I use it in most of my patterns as you see. I really love to finish heads of flies with it. Um, it also can help with durability if you paint over a body section with it. It also gives a good shine. It just, it brings out definition in materials. It's like putting a varnish over it. Um, so yeah, actually, I definitely changed my answer. UV resin for the win. And if you don't have any UV resin, I'd highly suggest picking some up. I'm going to link some down below. That's my favorite. Um, there are plenty of options out there. And in my time tying, I've gone through quite a few. And I landed on this one because it doesn't have a tacky finish. So if you hit it with a UV light, it cures quick and it doesn't have that stickiness afterwards. If you still get that stickiness with this one that you're, um, that I'm talking about, which is linked down below. Uh, what the problem probably is, is that your light's just not powerful enough. So I see a lot of people that buy these really cheap UV lights and boy, it's a waste of your money. They might cost $20 compared to $40 or $60. Spend the extra money because you're going to do it anyway. Um, so yeah, if you're going to do UV resin, get a good quality UV resin. Some of them are tacky, even when you zap them really well. And in addition to that, they, uh, some of the cheaper ones, which brands I won't mention, but anyway, use the one that I've linked below. That's, that one's fantastic. I've used it for two or three years now since I switched over, I think. The biggest thing about them is they don't yellow over time. Um, so I tied a bunch with this other brand and looked back in my fly box after this was the first year I worked with UV resin. Um, so tied up a bunch of patterns, made some cool stuff with them put them in the fly box. And of course, you know, I didn't lose them all, thankfully. So I stored them away, broke them out next spring and noticed that, oh geez, all of these flies are yellow. Like the backs of them turn this off, off white color, I guess you could say. And it, you know, you could still, I still fished them, but if you're going for that clear, transparent look, then you don't want it to change color afterwards. Yeah. So I'd recommend the, uh, the one from Solar Res in the comments below. Uh, wow, that was a tangent. So uh, yeah, the question of that was, what was my favorite uh, tying material? Sorry about the rant. And the second part of that question, which we didn't get to, was what is my least favorite material? That one's easy. Deer hair. I really don't like working with deer hair. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I've seen some beautiful flies made with deer hair, but 
for me, I've just never spent a lot of time doing it. So yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I give props to anyone who's skilled at working with deer hair. I see all kinds of just beautiful trimmed up heads and they're well done, but it's just, I, I don't know, it's never really interested me at this time, you know, in the future, it might be something I work with more, but you know, I'll do a deer hair wing and stuff like that. But even then you'll notice that I tie them very sparse because I don't like how chaotic they can be. So usually I'll select the very straight fibers that aren't hollow so when you tighten them down they don't flare out on you they sit nice and perfectly straight i just i really prefer that look with deer hair for some reason that's more of a personal preference anyway so that's that's my least favorite material definitely the first thing that comes to mind next question so where do i get my inspiration yeah so i get my inspiration from all over the place it used to be from tying books, but now with social media, that's where all my inspiration comes from. I follow a bunch of people I look up to, um, people who are very inventive and creative with fly tying. That way, when I'm scrolling through my feed, you know, these ideas just get burnt in my head. And I don't watch um, fly tying videos. I make them, but, but I don't watch them. Uh, it's probably what makes my videos unique in the fact that, you know, they're not, not really based on whatever everyone else is doing. They're just what I think is a, a great, great way to make a video. When I first started fly tying, I would rely more heavily on them. You know, I'd look at a pattern and I'd try to really recreate that specific pattern. But for those of you who have tied um, for quite some time now, you'd know as you get better at tying, you look at a pattern and you know exactly how it was made. Uh, you don't really need to see the full blown, you know, every thread wrap in a video. You just look at a pattern, you get the ideas and you tie what you like. So now I draw a lot of inspiration from uh, just pictures and I, you know, that puts ideas in my head. So when I sit down at the vice, I do quite the opposite. I don't look at anything. I have an idea of a pattern, a general pattern that I want to tie, maybe an idea of a bug I want to recreate. And then I sit down there with all my materials around me, see what my options are. And um, with all that inspiration I got from Instagram, you know, things pop in my head about different combinations and um, I just recreate whatever I feel like making that day. It's um, fly tying can be very artistic. Once you have the skills down, you can really do whatever you like. Yeah, that's where I draw my inspiration, mostly Instagram. Flying tying videos are a great place to do it. When I was uh, a little earlier in my career, the videos were helpful because if I didn't know how to do a specific technique, you can go check that part out and uh, learn how to do it. The next question is, what is the best time to fish for brook trout and salmon? Well, that's a difficult one to answer because it, you know, where are you from, right? You know, if I told you the best time to fish for them uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and you're in the Southern Hemisphere, that's going to be very different times of year. You know, I'll just speak from Maine. That's, that's where my experience is. The best time of year to fish in Maine for brook trout and salmon, if you want to catch a lot of fish, is spring. Spring's when fish in our area they come into the river because there's just a plethora of food you know the smelt start spawning there and that's going to be their earliest food source but immediately after that they stick around because of how much bug life comes alive and fish they they simply follow food sources you know whatever is going to be the most plentiful the most nutritious and the easiest food source to get is where you're going to find fish targeting it um, and in the springtime the rivers in our area are just the best place to do that. So fish travel upriver specifically for the reason of feeding, which makes them far easier to catch. But, um, so if you want numbers, at least in Maine, spring's the time to do it. And that is from, this is prime time, not the earliest time you can fish for them, but prime time is mid-May to mid-June. You know, that's when the fishing's absolutely on fire. There's definitely a tail end to both of those. It depends on season, how quickly the ice melts and how quickly the rivers warm, but those are usually optimal times of years here in Maine. If you want a trophy, you're going to have to fish in the fall because that's when the brook trout and the salmon are coming to the rivers for a very different reason. Sure, there's still food in them, but the fish are coming up here specifically to breed, which means that you're going to have a larger class of fish moving up river. So yeah, in the fall, um, especially when I'm fishing, I'm looking for those unique uh, large fish, generally speaking. Not always the case, depending on the river. Uh, but yeah, fall's a great time of year to go out and catch some really beautiful fish here in Maine. So yeah, I mean, if you want numbers, go fish in the spring, generally from April, no, excuse me, May, mid-May to mid-June. But if you're looking for 
trophies and size of fish, you know, we're kind of capped here. A lot of our rivers and main close September 30th. So September is the best time, but honestly, the rivers are generally pretty warm until the last week. So I try to find rivers that stay open a little bit later, usually through October. Early October is a great time to fish if you have the option. If not, make sure you focus on that last week of September in Maine. You can catch some really good fish then in rivers that otherwise close just a week later. All right, so that's a little bit about fishing. Yeah, and so this this podcast is going to be about fly tying and fly fishing, so feel free to ask about both. I have primary knowledge in fly tying, um, and I, I do a ton of fishing for brook trout and salmon. Uh, don't Don't ask too much about warm water fish. That's just not what I know. Hopefully we can bring someone on the podcast who's more knowledgeable than me about those subjects. You can ask them. But yeah, for me, my experience is fly tying uh, for trout and salmon. That's just my bread and butter. Next question is, what patterns do I specialize in? Well, I guess I just touched upon that. So, you know, being in Maine, especially being from northern Maine, is trout and salmon are the primary uh, game fish up there so that's yeah so i'd say i'd specialize in once again trout salmon patterns and there's you know there's a lot of crossover for me it's brook trout and landlocked salmon but trout respond to and live in places that have very similar food sources so don't worry about you know if a lot of people ask me quote unquote i'm quoting my fingers because i'm french and i talk with my hands i need patterns for brook trout and i also need patterns for rainbow trout and that's fine you know there are some things that'll work for one species over another but it's very small differences like brook trout i really love um orange and red they just respond to it well but that doesn't mean other fish don't right what i usually say to these people anyway is if these fish are in the same river they're going to be feeding on very similar things there might be something about a particular species that is more drawn to one color than another like a good example of that is lake trout i don't know why but they love chartreuse just fact if you want to catch a lake trout use chartreuse it's a great color for it um so but other than those things you know there's nothing no reason that you can't use a natural looking green caddis to catch the brook trout in that water and then also use it to catch the rainbow trout so i, I just don't think that's a really good way to look at it as using flies for specific species that's a very general statement because you know there definitely are cases that it's not true but especially if you're new to fly fishing don't worry about that in the beginning worry about getting you know worry about what's in your river do you have caddis do you have mayflies and midges chances are if there's trout in the water you have all three of those so work on filling your boxes with those patterns And then as you get into fly fishing, you spend time on that river, you're going to start to realize things that work for a particular species. You know, like I said, for brook trout, you know, if I were to tie, let's just say a hare's ear, and I was tying a hare's ear specifically for brook trout, well, you know, me going into the spring, I'm going to tie a nice olive hare's ear, got all kinds of mayflies that have that general pattern in the spring. Uh, But if I wanted to tie it specifically for brook trout, Maybe I'd put a little hot spot in there. It'd probably work for, well, it would work for the landlocked salmon in that area too. But, you know, a, a hot spot seems to do a lot for brook trout. Just a little collar, a little flash of color. They're not picky fish. Brook trout kind of snap at anything. <laughs> Actually, I, I did a video with the, um, you probably saw it on the fly tying channel. I tied up a cheeseburger and I used that to catch brook trout. They just, they, you know, they don't care that much. I went and fished it during september which we have a lot of terrestrials out at that point big grasshoppers so i just took that cheeseburger slapped it on the surface and they'd just have a triggered reaction you know big thing just hit the water (laughs) it looked like it was moving faster in the wind and they would just come up and bite at it so yeah brook trout aren't always the pickiest fish in the world Uh, but yeah anyway that's that's kind of that's that's kind of how i view favorite patterns there's patterns that work well for trout just because they mimic the forage in that water and there's some that maybe work better than others for particular areas and particular fish, but that's not, that's really fine tuning. And if you're just getting into fly fishing, you don't need to worry about that. And for now, that's actually all the questions I have. I probably could have grabbed a few more, but that doesn't matter. 
Um, so anyway, thank you guys for listening and tuning in to the first ever Mainly Flies podcast. I did a lot of rambling. Um, I recognize that. <laughs> These will improve over time. This is a new format for me and an, a new endeavor. There's always going to be a learning curve, but I am excited to see where this new channel goes and how we progress. Um, we're going to start off with some questions next time. So go into the comments, drop down your question, and I will give you my take on it. Might not be the right take, but it's mine. Uh, so drop your question down below and we'll start off the next episode with those questions. So um, let me know your thoughts on this. You know, I'm happy to change formats, make it a little more organized than we did today. I just wanted to get started. I don't like being held back by having things be perfect. I like to go for them and learn as I go. And I do that by looking at your comments. So let me know what you thought. Let me know what should be changed. Next time, I think we'll go with a little more formatting. So we'll do our questions and then we'll hop into a specific topic and I'll, I'll flesh out the ideas a little more. So I'm not talking in circles. I'll jot down my thoughts and that way we can stay on track a little bit. So anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you did enjoy this first podcast and I will see you in the next one.